All right, welcome back to Business Casual. Welcome back to the channel. I'm here with Agent Rachel Lupa, all of y'all's favorite. <laughs> Agent Rachel Lupa, but if you, name, I guess. Yeah, no. if, you turn, uh, if you turn the subtitles I'm on, Ray Chalupa, and we're here with Morgan Blank as well. Morgan, you want to tell everybody kind of what you do? Yes, um, I oversee all of Trevor's off-field marketing opportunities, um, everything having to relate or that relates to his brand. Um, that's kind of a catch-all, I guess. That's the most broad way to describe it. But um, yeah, that's yeah. But she kills it. Yeah, definitely kills it. Does a really good job. Um, I wanted to start this conversation off because taking a player from, I guess there's like three types of players, uh, in the way I see it. There's players where you don't know what their brand is. Right? Maybe they aren't on social media, you don't know a whole lot about them, maybe they just don't really have a brand they never thought through it. Yeah. That's one group. You have another group of players that have a mixed bag or a bad brand. They, they're branded as being problems in the clubhouse or selfish or bad guy or whatever, the, whatever it is, right? And then you have players that have a really strong brand and are really marketable. You, you know, think of someone like Francisco Lindor, known for the smile, known for having a lot of fun, like he's on all sorts of commercials and T-Mobile and all this different stuff. So someone that has a really strong brand, everyone knows who he is. So, Rich, like, I think I'm a decent example of kind of all of those. I started off. Started off really as. I guess I didn't really. I, I never really went through a time where I didn't have a brand because I was a high profile. You didn't, pick, but, but you didn't care. Yeah. Like, I, cause so I remember, you know, ten years ago, you. I mean, we would talk about you know certain players that might be very high profile or you know or on MLB Network all the time, and everyone knows who they are, and you just oh, I don't care about that. You know, you didn't care, mm -hmm. um, and then. I think as you got a little bit older, you started to realize having a brand matters. And so then you kind of saw this change where now you cared, but the problem was before, because you just didn't care about having a brand, I would say you're different in the sense that when you didn't care, you it wasn't like you didn't exist on social media. Mm. You just You just said things and kind of talked out of your ass mm. on social media which was very different from how you are in the rest of your life, where everything's very calculated, right? How you train, everything you do, there's a purpose. But then it was like social media, there was no thought behind <laughs> it ever. It was like a chess match. It's like people would say something to me and I'm like, oh, I get to be witty and I'd outwit them or say something back. Yeah, and but, back, but you but. didn't... And then there, wasn't, I, there wasn't a direction. I wasn't trying you, to accomplish something. It was just kind of a one-off thing here and there. Yeah, right? and it just came across a lot of times, and again, I think this happens with anyone on social media, is just it, you can be misunderstood with how you say something because sometimes the tone doesn't come across right or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of talked out of your ass and people formed these opinions about you. And then all of a sudden, you know, fast forward five, six years, you realize, wait, like having a brand matters and it'll help my business ventures and off the field stuff. So now I need to have a brand, like what should I do? And then we were at this really difficult place where you were completely misunderstood by you know the public. Um, nobody wants to work with you. Nobody wants really anything to do with you. When you fail, people love it, yeah. right? People are rooting to see you lose. And that was kind of where you're at. And so how do you make this change where now you're caring about your brand and you want to build this brand, but you have a really bad perception just in the media. Yeah. I want to get into some of the things that we did to go from, to like reverse it and kind of build towards where we're at now. But Morgan, I want to toss to you on the, the three calibers of players and coming from your side of the, of the coin in your experience, guys that have no brand. Maybe they don't exist on social or they're just, you know, they don't post a whole lot. Or they, no one really knows who the player is or, or what they're about. What's your experience working with guys like that and trying to get them deals? And what kind of deals can you get those types of players? Yeah, I would say that anybody who's at an agency who has access to somebody who does their marketing, they need to have a sit down conversation with them and try and identify what we call our, your brand pillars, right? How, how do your 
teammates describe you? How would they describe you? Um, what are your interests? What are kind of the foundations of, what is the foundation kind of of who you are? That could be three, four, five things, but it needs to be very concise, clear, and it should be able to translate through all areas of, of your game, of your life. It's gotta be authentic too, right? right. To, to that individual. Like some guys just like to go out and fish and they're super low key, that's fine. Some guys, I mean, I think of Gronk as like the prototypical party guy, you know, and he right. kind of built a brand off that. They, they all can work. You know, you just gotta be a, kind of authentic to who the player is, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's important because authenticity, again, comes through in what brand partnerships you you end up getting um, comes through in your social, in your everyday life. And a lot of times guys will have an easier time wanting to do those activations with brands or posts on social when it's something that they're doing anyway and that's natural. And so that's ultimately like the best fit, you know, is when both parties kind of fit um, yeah. together, so. What's it like when you're reaching out on behalf of someone who may want uh, a card deal or um, a local uh, event or signing or you know, some of these things and when you reach out to a brand and you have to kind of explain who the player is or what they're about like how do those conversations go is it an uphill I gotta imagine it's an uphill climb to try to Especially interest, I feel for, right? for baseball players. Yeah. Well, right, like, because baseball were, players aren't in the aren't in the spotlight. I mean, almost. They, yeah. Right. There are a ton of factors that go into this. Um, oftentimes, though, you know, baseball players should actually be at an advantage because they are on TV more than any other uh, any other professional athletes are. Um, just given the number of games that are in a season, you would think that that would be a good thing. But um, a lot of times. I've gotten, I've had many different responses when I talk to brands. They either don't know who the guy is, or he's not performing well, or he's in a poor market, or there's a lot of different aspects that go into, you know, we don't have budget. So there's there's a lot of different things that brands will tell you when you're on a, a phone call with them. Um, and a lot of times too, it's in this business, it is, it's all about, you know, relationships. And sometimes the first call that you have with a brand is just, you're trying to learn more about what they're looking for and you're listening and they may uh, they may tell you some things that you can then use you know in your negotiations with them later on down the road but it is important to kind of ask them how you can help them how your client can help them kind of reach their goals because ultimately their job is to sell product or whatever it may be and if your athlete if your client is not helping them do that then they're kind of struggling to see the value I think so is it, so you, you mentioned not performing well in the field and also uh, not in a big market and some of these things. So I think the driving force behind that is just the visibility, right? Brands want to know that when they're working with someone, it's getting their product in front of a large net of potential buyers, right? Absolutely. I think too, I'll, I'll say this, um, that those factors I listed are just some things that brands will say to us, but we know ultimately what the guy does with his personal brand on his social, that can trump a lot of things. That can take a lot of those no's away immediately. There's case studies that have been done. Um, there's a guy that was drafted in the last round of the NBA draft, but he got one of the most lucrative shoe deals because of what he was doing on his social. So that matters. Um, as we all know at this table, most companies, most, most fans rather, would rather follow an individual player rather than a team account. So when you look at um, when you look at all of those factors together, I think that, you know, if, as long as you're kind of taking care of your business on the field, but there's a lot to be said and a lot to, a lot of money to be made for guys that understand how to do social right, how to do their branding right. So, yeah. yeah. So before we jump into kind of the second group of players, which is this kind of mixed bag, they have a, either a bad brand or kind of this mixed brand, what are some of the deals that guys with no brand right now can see do they are they getting card deals are they getting shoe deals is it hard to get them these types of deals are they seeing national tv ads are they like what what kind of what what part of the spectrum are they on as far as that goes so guys that don't really have a strong presence on social um it's it is it is difficult you have the guys that don't really have a social but they are you know all-star caliber player um those, those deals do happen because of what they're doing on the field. Um, 
the number one question I got asked at my last job at an agency was, how do I get a car deal? How do I get a shoe deal? The car deals, um, those happen in kind of three uh, waves of a guy's career. A lot of times it is going to be, you know, when a guy gets drafted and there's obviously like different rounds that um, companies will they'll look at guys you know, in certain, you know, one through rounds one through five. Um, but prospect deals, rookie card deals when a guy debuts, and again, it kind of just depends on who the guy is and what and how much the offer is going to be. Um, and then there's other opportunities for a guy when he's um, a vet to get a deal, but outside of that, those are kind of they're slotted, so they're. You kind of know going in what, yeah. what a guy's going to get. Um, and then equipment deals, again, I can't tell you how many winter meetings I've been in where the conversation with um, equipment companies is maybe more or less dependent on what he's doing on social. Um, again, you'll hear kind of the, you know, he's not in the right market or he's, you know, a middle reliever and it's just not enough TV time for us. But outside of that, they're looking at his presence on online as well. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, brand deals, um, endorsements. There's opportunity out there for, you know, paper post, um, but national deals are really reserved for the guys that like you see that have kind of that complete package, right? They're active on social, they're doing their job on the field and they just, they're, they're in a good market, whatever it may be, but yeah, yeah so. Again, just about the advertisers getting the eyeballs on their product, yes. right? And yeah. the, more, the more visibility you have, the better. And so I think this kind of, you know, the natural transition here is if you have no brand and then you start to develop some sort of brand, it can be a mixed bag. And so, Rach, what, because you've really helped oversee my last year or whatnot on the brand side of things and trying to get more accurate information, I, I would phrase it. And feel free to, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but. I feel like just trying to get more information about who I actually am and the, the truth behind who I, you know, what I'm passionate about and whatnot out there in front of people. But you've been involved with that for a while, but really heavily over the last year. So what, yeah. what's that experience been like and what struggles have you faced and what kind of activations have you tried to do to help turn that around? Yeah, so obviously I knew you for the last 10 years. So I know who you are, are as a person. I think I have a very good read on that. I've also seen just how mischaracterized you are in the social in, in social media and just in the media in general. So I think the biggest struggle that we had first when I really started to help you was we need to, we have to change the perception of you and just this. I mean, to be frank, like your perception was this selfish kind of person when I, you and I both knew behind closed doors that you are always trying to help other people, right? But it wasn't, it, it came across for whatever reason and for maybe the things you've said in the past are just not said, that you just care about yourself and, you know, it, it's all about you and that you're not like, friendly or whatever. So it was changing the, the perception. I think a lot of it started on Twitter for you, um, whether it was how you responded and who you responded to. And I know it kind of bothered you at first that you had to do it and that you couldn't just, you know, say and do whatever you felt like that like most people can do. I can, you know, for the most part do it still. You know, Morgan can kind of say what she wants, but unfortunately you can't. Yeah, my thought so. is like, okay, if this person at wherever they're working or in their mom's basement or whatever is going to say whatever they want to me, then like, well, I can't, should, <laughs> they, should be, they should be informed, like dumb people need to be told that they're dumb sometimes. I'm, I'm you know? with you, but the, <laughs> I'm with you, but it wasn't helpful to build your brand. Right. And because you really needed a kind of a major course correction. So I think one of the most important things we did starting off was when we got you a PR person. Because again, like not, no kind of one of us can handle all of these things. It just doesn't make sense. We hired obviously Mel Van Dusen at Burke Communications to, you know, really focus on your PR and just the message that was out there about you and who, which audiences we got you in front of so we could change it over time. And I think that took 
several months to even see any change. Because I remember in the beginning, you first would start, like, I don't know, tweeting at someone that is just a fan that was just saying something nice to you. And you don't, you didn't used to respond to people that were just being nice to you. It was only to the people that were taking shots at you. And then it was like, if you even responded something nice, it was like you got people, you know, the trolls responding to that about like saying more mean things. And you were like, I, nothing I can do, I can't win you would, you know, do some charity thing and it would completely get looked over and then people would, or, you know, someone would write about it and then everyone would just comment on it, but, but don't forget he's such a bad person. And so it took some time and I think it's one of those unfortunate realities that, you know, it takes a, a long time to build a reputation and a second to destroy it. And so we really had to work on changing your reputation and I think Mel really helped with that. and kind of getting the right audiences to, to hear you. Um, and, and a lot of times that meant people that initially don't like, were very vocal about not liking you. Yeah. And giving them a chance to just talk to you. Because I think, and I've told you this before, there are very few people that get to know you and that say, I don't like Trevor Bauer. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I know so many people that will say, oh God, I, I hate Trevor Bauer. I'm like, do you know him? I'm like, no, but like, have you seen this stuff? I'm like, okay. But every single person, and I've had people come to me specifically and say like, wow, he, he's actually a pretty, pretty neat guy. But it's funny because people without knowing you at all have very strong feelings about yeah, you. Yeah, it's polarized. It's either they hate me or they really love me and there's really not anybody in between, right? right? Yeah, there's no one that's just indifferent to Trevor Bauer. Yeah. <laughs> like that's that, that doesn't, which isn't a bad thing because I mean, look, like that a lot of times is really beneficial to have a polarizing identity. Right. I think the problem was in what made me so frustrated by it. It wasn't it wasn't that you were truly yourself and peep and it was polarizing, which I'd be fine with. And I think you're more or less at that point now. But people, this polarizing factor you had wasn't even who you were yeah it was like they had you branded as this whatever character and it wasn't yeah you. yeah the media kind of created you know they take certain little things yeah. and then they create this narrative about me and started in arizona with a misunderstanding with coaches and a catcher yeah. and then as i was branded as a bad teammate and then any little thing that happened you were would get, always it would just get piled yeah. on and then at some point no information that came out that was contrary to the to that belief would ever make a dent because they would yeah. just discard the, yeah. the positive and just focus on the negative. If people want it now, like if they don't like the fact that you're very, you know, you don't play baseball like a traditional baseball player, the way you train, the fact that just how you use social media and like what he's doing with branding, that's very different. If somebody said, I hate that about Trevor Bauer, he's not a true like traditional baseball player, I would have no problem with yeah. that. That that I can respect that. Yeah, I don't need everybody's cup of tea. Right. Yeah, but yeah. but that is based on truth. Like their opinion on you is based on truth and that's all I wanted for, like for you. Yeah. Because again, like Morgan said, it has to be authentic. Yeah. And if it's not an authentic brand, then it, it's going to come. I mean, it just doesn't work. Like you can't yeah. make it grow. Yeah. And so if it was based in who you were authentically, then fine. Yeah. But it wasn't, and so it was changing that. Right, and so we're kind of in this transition period right now on going from this mixed bag to hopefully something that's more positive and more true. And Morgan, we started working together last year, so you've kind of seen a little bit of the transition, yes. and so you've had different experiences over the, even the past four or five months. Has that changed when you reach out to people, when you're talking to people on my behalf? Like, has the tone changed? Or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think everything that we've done this off season. The events that we've put on, the things that you've done on your socials, um, the advice that you're giving to people, the content that you're putting out, um, the opportunities that you are taking as a, you know from PR, whatever it may be, have I mean, anecdotally speaking, and even just like numbers on the paper are showing that what you're doing is is working. So well, I mean, yeah, and I think she's able now, like because we were able to spend so much time and fix your reputation and just make it more accurate. Not necessarily, I mean, I think it is better now, but it, it was just taking it from a misrepresented version of you to a real 
Trevor Bauer. This is Trevor Bauer. Yeah. And then I think it makes her job a lot easier because now she can take it and really go to companies and she can understand what you would be aligned with and then yeah. take it from there. Because if she went to a company where we know that Trevor is very aligned with this, but you know, a year ago they might have been like, we don't want to work with someone like Trevor Bauer. Whereas now it's like, they're like, yeah, that makes sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's important on brand deals to understand that it's not just, it can't just be in the company's favor, right? The athlete and their brand has to be aligned as well. It has to yeah. be kind of a synergistic um, relationship. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So if yeah. the brand's principles aren't aligned with the athletes or the athlete's principles aren't aligned with the brand's, it just, it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna fit well, well together, but if you don't know what your athletes' principles and brand and brand pillars are, yeah. it's impossible to reach out to brands that are like right. minded, right? And you have to do your research as a as a marketing person. You have to do your research on that company before going into that call, anyway. Um, I think. But going back really quick to what you were saying earlier, outside of just brand deals, I think understanding what you want to do how you want to establish yourself in the baseball space also helps. So it's not just, um, it's not, might not be a product endorsement that you're doing. You also want to continue building out kind of your speaking engagements and build out that side of, of your personal brand. So those are other opportunities that we're looking for for you to speak at places like ABCA uh, Coaches Convention or World, World Baseball Coaches Convention, those types of things. So just to, again, kind of continue to, to build that out for you, I think is, um, you know, yeah. important. And so. marketing isn't always about dollars, right? right. It's about, so, so some athletes or some people are interested in making a lot of money off the field and they're driven by that and that's what they want to do. So you'd handle that case differently than someone like me who's, I am interested in making money off the field, but I'm also interested in having an influence on yes. young baseball players and impacting people in a positive way, helping with uh, people who may be in athletics but also in academics, understand that it's okay to be both because this yeah. is kind of my, my history, right? So some of your job is about finding money-making opportunities for me, but some of it is also about finding play, speaking engagements, like you said, or community involvement or helping with the charity campaigns that I run. And so it's, it's got to be the same thing in that too, right? As far as being able to go to those organizations, maybe it's a college that I'm going to speak at and say, yeah. You know, hey, look, this is this is who you know, this is Trevor Bauer. Here's who he really is. This is a strong association with the principles that I'm about, and you can go find partnerships there to help me have more influence in the areas that I'm trying to influence. Right. Right. Absolutely. And then, like again, going back to when you're sitting down with your marketing person, whoever's helping you in this area of of, of your life, it is important to. You, you might even change six months down the road, um, but you have to have that open dialogue with the person that's helping you do that. Um, you need to be able to identify those things pretty clearly and pretty early on, um, and then kind of continue to evolve from there. But the conversation has to happen pretty immediately for you to be able, as the marketing person, to be able to go and find those opportunities and then be able to pivot if, you know, something. But I think, I mean, but to that point, I think it's important to, can, like the dialogue has to continue because if Trevor was still the same Trevor that I knew 10 years ago, we'd be in a very different spot. I mean, I couldn't see you, you know, hanging around having dinner and doing Bauer Bites with, you know, five other players every night. I mean, yeah. you wanted to be alone. So you've changed a lot. And so right. kind of, you know, you're... I guess the strategy that you take with a player, you have to continue the dialogue. Like it's yeah. not a one time, hey, here are my brand pillars, this is what I want. And then just, you know, because hopefully you're working, you know, your marketing agent's working with you for many years. And hopefully, you know, the person you are at 18 when you're drafted or, you know, whatever, yeah is not the same person you are when you're, you know, 45. Right. But And the more opportunities that come about because of what you're doing with marketing more things that you will be exposed to and you will find that you have other interests now and other things drop off that list and so it is just it's this just constant stream of information and communication that you have to share with that person and um, it's always a lot easier when you have less clients to worry about um, and it yeah. yeah how much how much time would you say it takes if you were gonna do your best job for your clients, and that was the given. How many clients do you think you could handle 
and give full attention to, or the, the necessary attention to all of them? Is it one? Is it five? Is it 50? I, I, don't, I don't know the range. What's the range? For if, if there's another guy, if there's another player like you, not a ton, maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. two or three. You, you are very She's unique in that. You're very unique in that. He, you're actually not high maintenance in ways that not most the normal people way. would. Yeah. yeah. You're not calling, asking me to book dinner reservations or to ship your car. That might be, you know, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, some guys may not have the desire to have, you know, a merch line and which, which then would require, you know, different email campaigns and managing a database and all of those things. Some guys just are motivated by, I want to make as much money off the field as possible. Help me do that. Other guys are very heavily involved in the creation of content like you are and, and in business. And so it, it really just depends. But honestly, probably if there were two, three of you, that would be probably more than anybody should be able to handle. And knowing, understanding that there's always something that we could be doing. Right. So that's, that's the key is if you have 50 guys, you're not able to go really deep on anything with anybody. You know, you could, I could spend weeks just calling businesses in Cincinnati, you know, yeah. trying to find an opportunity. So it is, it's about just like, you kind of have to gauge it's a, yeah. it's a small number then. Yes. I mean, relative yeah. to how the industry works currently, <laughs> yeah. and Rach, this is kind of the idea of your, enti- of your agency, of Luba Sports. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons that we're all working together and so well aligned, because if you're going to really create something, help, help a player create something that's going to last, not only through his career, but also in, in the post, post-baseball, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time and thought and, and attention, right? And Players during season can't do that. They have to play. They have to take care of the on-field. You know, that's that's the money maker. That's where mm-hmm. they need to have their attention. So having a team around you that actually that you can trust that's actually putting in the hours to help you with this st- type of stuff and uh, you know coming up with the thoughts of you know just that a brand pillar even exists that you should probably figure out. You know, from that to like you said, calling a bunch of people or like, hey, we should get you involved in this type of speaking thing or hey, we could go to the next level of this. Like having someone that's actually putting in the time and the effort is important if you're going to be able to, to build that for yourself. And I so think it, but I think it's at, it, a, at a traditional agency, you may have, and you can speak to this too, you may have 300, 400, 500 clients at the agency. And so if, even if you just have, let's say you have 365 clients, you're spending like one, one day, day a year, a year on, on, yeah. on that client. <laughs> so generally what happens is the top end guys, or the people that ask for it the most. Yes. Or the ones that are gonna generate the most revenue for right. for so, the agency. Sometimes though, that, that that's not the reality. I mean, you, you're constantly having to put out fires. You can walk into your job that day and say, okay, I'm gonna take care of the 50 most important guys that our agency is either deemed as most important or you know the stats are telling us they're most important that day. And you walk in and there's fires that have to get put out. And so really, take your schedule and kind of throw that out the window. So yeah. if, again, if you are at a, you know, a larger agency, it is, it's you, you're, you're at a disadvantage. You really yeah. are. Yeah. Cause you're not getting the time spent on your specific needs. Right. And this is really how loop of sports came to be is you identified that players were not just the numbers game. It just there. Yeah. The number, I mean, the numbers just didn't line up that you would get the attention that every player is going to get the attention that for what they're paying their agent that they should get and that they deserve, I think, to get. And then there just isn't that aligned incentive to do it because mm-hmm. that, that's a lot of yes. a lot of work with like for one person usually. OK, so if I'm at a big agency and I'm the one marketing person, right, and I have to go and handle, you know, 50 plus guys or more and then you know, they're not even, I'm not even, the agency's not even really making money on that, let's say. Right, because, so what would an agency, to, like 20% on a, on a marketing deal? 15 to 20 is, is standard. I know some agencies don't charge anything for it, which then that makes it really challenging also. Um, well, because so, then the incentive is to not do anything, right? Because if they're going to spend time, but there's no gain for them, because they're, it, they're not you know, truly incentivized to yeah. go help. If I'm going to make money by put, either getting you a big deal because I'm going to get a cut of it or just putting in the work, then I'm going to go out and try to get every single person a deal. Right. Well, sometimes small deals will come through 5,000 for a, and it's not worth it. 
think about the time that you would have to put for a five thousand dollar deal yeah. <laughs> which and then how much like 20 percent of that okay so is that really worth it nah. and then it might call it might be you know yeah, 10 an, hours an agency plus. is making 750 off of off of that for you know and it probably you know doesn't they those things don't happen overnight you might get lucky and yeah. have an incoming something come in from the team if you've got you know a good relationship with them or something but for the most part, if you're going out and finding those, that takes hours, it takes days, it could sometimes take weeks, months. Yeah. So it's, just, it's, like, just, it's not worth it. You're different because you make money based on the incentive to work and the time you spend working on behalf of your players, right? Yeah, if I don't work, I mean, the work that I do for a player, I'm getting paid for. So, you know, you can rest assured that I want to work for you just as you know badly as you want me to do work and you know create value. Right. on your end and if there is a point where I can't handle that much work or it just doesn't make sense I don't have the time to do it in my day the hours that you want work being done for you just I can go hire somebody else to do it it just mm -hmm. makes more sense and then but it's but, it, but I can I'm in a situation where because you're paying for the work I can bring somebody else on to give you the attention you deserve right. unlike at a traditional agency where if they go higher, they're getting their percentages of the contracts, you know, from for baseball. And then if you want all this off the field stuff and now you require all this attention just for you and they have, you know, hundreds of other players and then they're going to go spend another, what, 80,000, 90, 100, 150 on a, an employee to hire just to be able to provide you with more attention right. it doesn't make business sense. Right. Yeah, so I guess that's where the incentives, that, that's really the biggest thing that attracted me to the Luba Sports model is just the incentives all seem to be aligned and like you get paid for the work that you do. If I want more work because I'm going to get more benefit out of that, then I feel you should be compensated for that. That's really why working with Morgan is even a possibility because there's, you know, it makes financial sense to be able to bring someone on right. to do that work right? because, because of the way it's set up. And I mean, we've already seen in, what's it been? It's been five, five months, five, about half a year. So, yeah. And we've already seen a, a large uptick in my off field and uh, I think, portfolio. And I think that is something to, you know, make sure we hit on is that how beneficial that that has been. Mm -hmm. The change just in your job and how much easier it is, you know, once you start gaining a momentum with it you know and more people are like that yeah and i just catch that um when more people now know who trevor bauer is it's a lot easier for morgan to go out and get you better you know better deals and now your value is higher mm. and so it just you keep building on it but you know in the beginning when nobody knows who trevor or they've heard of that trevor bauer that starting pitcher from cleveland who's like a headache like it's not easy to go do morgan's job when <laughs> Kind of, they know who you are, but they in a very bad way. They do, and that's it. Whereas now, you know, you're able to grow so many things. You're able to grow your media company, you know, R and D stuff, everything that you want, and it just keeps building off of it because you have now this a much larger reach. And just, a very solid foundation to yeah. an accurate yeah. representation of who I am, and it's a solid foundation. And if something bad happens, I think we're at a place where. And, and it continues to grow, but if there is a hiccup ever, I think we're, we do have a solid foundation to rest on. Whereas before, you know, a year or two ago, you do one dumb thing that, and look, everyone messes up. Yeah, sure. Everyone set, tweets something they shouldn't tweet, or whatever it is, or says something in a post-game interview that they shouldn't right. say. But it's really hard to come back from that if you don't have this strong foundation. And I think you, you're at a point where you do, and so it's a lot easier to rebound. Yeah. I think it's important, too, to note that, like, if for other players that are watching this, is to look and see how much time, money, whatever that you're putting in to, to your personal brand. I mean... It's an investment. It's, it is an investment. You've got, you know, a team of five plus you know more than that people though but it's showing how seriously you're taking that and i think that that shouldn't go unnoticed because a lot of guys just think that hey you know i'm gonna get those services through my agency or um i'm gonna have a family you know member you know help or i'm gonna do it myself and it's just not the reality we're here to kind of help 
elevate and um, you know make your brand better. But, but and it's yeah. a full time like, job. It is. It's yeah. a full-time more job. or less. So yeah. that's. I mean, the, one of the things that I'm passionate about is seeing a better landscape for the players. And so this is one of the reasons I'm building momentum and trying to build out the content side of things to make it more accessible for players to have someone that can produce content on a large network of baseball fans so more baseball fans can get an idea of who this player is. That's one of the reasons that we're working together, Morgan, is so that we can offer, and we held a, a branding event for anyone who wanted to come this spring training before the coronavirus came along. And the, the idea is to educate players and give them resources. You know, I, I've been very fortunate in my career to have made it. A lot of players aren't that fortunate. And having a brand or a little, a little bit of it, at least, in their time in professional baseball uh, sets them up in large ways down the line in life. And I want to see them be able to maximize that time that they have. They've worked really hard to get to this spot in professional baseball, and they should be able to maximize it. So we're trying to build out services to help those players make it more accessible and, and not as complicated. So uh, before we go, on that note, for someone, for a player that may be watching this that doesn't have a brand or has never really thought about it, starting from the, from the ground level, what are just a couple quick things to think about or easy tips to kind of get them going that you that you have? I mean, the social engagement has come up a lot. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they need to just take time to identify what what they do in their everyday life. If, if you don't have something, maybe start thinking about what some of the things that you do enjoy or like if you're, when you're not playing baseball, what are you doing? Ask your teammates, ask your friends, ask your family, who, who do you think I am? How would you describe me to somebody else that doesn't know me? Um, but find, find those interests. There's something, somebody can build a brand from something that they're doing in their daily life, whatever it is. You just have to kind of uncover that and have, you know, those conversations with, with yourself and people around you. I mean, that's, if nobody knows who you are, and I think just and taking yeah. inventory on what does my social media look like? Yes. And if somebody yeah. looked at it, what would they think? Uh, you know, someone that doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you go to somebody at Starbucks and show them your social media and say, you know, give them 10 seconds to look at the first little part of your Instagram. Uh, what do you think this person does or is or yeah. who mm -hmm. are they? Describe this person. Describe them. Yeah. And like, would they just say, oh, clearly a baseball player? Would they say someone who likes to hike? Who goes like, to Starbucks every day? Yeah. <laughs> and if you do, fine, like keep, Starbucks may be the end goal, right? But there are opportunities, there, it's a stepping stone. It's, there's processes in place that will ultimately get you to that brand that you really want to work with. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you got to start from, from somewhere and social is the vessel for kind of everything right now. Um, that's how people are finding people and yeah. it's just, I think you have to, and I think this was a big change that you made was whether you like it or don't, if you are going to commit to this, you have to use social media. There has to be a purpose to your social mm. media. Yeah, it's it, a tool. It, it's a tool instead of, look, if you don't care about a brand at all and none of this matters to you, then, you know, you just can post whatever or, or make two accounts. Make your family one that's just, you know, posting random stuff. But then the, your main account should be, there should be thought behind everything you post. And Do I want to bring... It should be public, not private. Yes. And definitely <laughs> take, make your, it... take your profile off could, private. We could go, right? And yeah. take it off about the social media. Yeah. Yeah. I have, to, I have right. two accounts, social. though. Yeah. But, like, I have a private one that's just family and, you know, so it's different. And then, and that's private. But, you know, it, you want to use... You should have it. And if you care about it, about your brand, you should have a social media account that you put thought into and is public. Yeah. You want to give the people an idea where they can find you online, Instagram or Twitter, or where they, <laughs> if they'd like to contact you? I know this is a hot topic, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I've actually, I once I break 100 followers, I might. <laughs> there we go. Let's, let's get um, yeah. let's get Morgan over I think she's followers. about six shy. Let's get where, where can was, they find that you? That was my choice. So to be fair, no, she yeah, just that, that was friend. that was my choice. But um, <laughs> we've been we've been collecting some content while we've been here in Scottsdale. Well, you were just I think you were so focused on working for players, and I hold on, I, I will, did. Yeah, I, I will say something that, and because I used to you know intern at a traditional agency, and it is very much, and if you look at anyone in the agency world, they don't exist really online. Mm -hmm. There's no social media presence. And I've gotten 
flack for it. I, you know, whatever. It's a polarizing thing yeah. that I've done. Just making my, putting myself out there, like building some sort of brand. And I think, I know it's very different than what a traditional agency would do. And you come from, you came yeah. from that. And, and yours was very, yours is, your social media is perfect for a traditional agency where you just, it's not, a, it has nothing to do with you. Yeah. But I think it's important for people to see, you know, if we're helping players build brands. That, that I myself, who's advising you on how to do that, can right. do that. So I think, yeah, yeah I mean, my, my attitude about it uh, this entire time, kind of until I got here, was that you know it wasn't about me it was about helping the athletes and i think that there's you can still care it's still about, about the that. athlete it is, but it's yeah. a way of showing you know that i can do the this importance. along with you and right. it is important um and so yeah that's... and your reach grows i mean my reach grows what i'm able to do for an athlete yeah, if, no if people yes, know who exactly i can i can actually use my and leverage my social media to help some other of people my clients as well so i think that that's you know, we're baby steps here for me, but I, I will. All right, let's, let's, yeah. let's, get you, let's get you over 100 followers. Where do people find you on Instagram? At blank, B-L-A-N-K underscore Morgan. Blank is her, her last My name. My actual it's last name, yes. Her it's incognito like a, last name. <laughs> and where do people find Agent Rachel Lupa? Um, Instagram is Rachel.Luba, R-E-C-H-E-L. Uh -huh. And my Twitter is Agent Rachel Luba. Agent Rachel Luba. And on YouTube, the subtitles will tell you my name is Ray Chalupa. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I'm a taco. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's, uh, that's been, that's been it. That's another episode of Business Casual. Uh, thank you guys for, for watching. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe, leave a comment, hit that thumbs up button uh, so you don't miss any future content. Let us know what you want to hear about. If you like this, didn't like it, want more of it, less of it, who you want to see more of, less of. If you just want to see them talk and not me, that's perfectly fine too. But We're here. Let, us know, let, us, let me know in the comments uh, what you guys want to see. We put out all this content to entertain and to help you guys. Um, so let us know, hit us up on socials, give Morgan and Rachel a follow, and uh, we'll see you for the next episode.